I'm a mathematician and cyberneticist. I've been studying uh, artificial systems for decades now and productionalizing machine learning techniques. And today I'd like to talk about a really hot topic, and that is artificial intelligence and its role in the healthcare system. One of the things that I think uh, has caused a lot of panic is people fail to take a fully cybernetic view of the world. To take a cybernetic view means to ask questions like, what are the fitness functions that this thing has to satisfy? How can it communicate with the rest of the world? What features can it extract from its reality? And what kind of responses can it provide to the rest of us as it tries to optimize against its own niche? This is the snakehead. Look at this, ah, it's ready to go. When, when they said the theme of today was movement, I decided movement means invasion. An invasive species is a really good way to do it. And this thing looks brutal, right? When it got introduced into the Potomac River Basin in 2004, it caused such a panic that the news reports started calling it a frankenfish. And if you're a biologist, a wildlife biologist, dealing with this kind of a fragile ecosystem, a complex system of intercommunicating inter webs, you freak out on something like this. By any fitness measure that you might have for a traditional species, this thing is a winner, right? It's twice as big as anything that lives there. It has no natural predators. It can reproduce twice a year. That's unusual for fish. Even humans can't reproduce twice a year. It breathes air. If you're a fish and you breathe air, you got a leg up. Not only that, <laughs> a fin up? Is that what I should have said? Oh, I need better writers. Not only that, you, it, it, it has the ability to adapt quickly to its system, and it finds the local varietals absolutely delicious. It eats voraciously on the local system. So it has found a niche. In 2004, it showed up, people panicked, Everybody expected to take over. They're probably going to take over the local buildings and local economy as well. This is a land-dwelling Japanese robot named Asimo, also named Honda Man, that was introduced in 2000 by the Honda Corporation. And when it showed up, it gave people a big panic as well, including in the healthcare industry, because one of the things they said is that this thing's going to be your doctor. But the question remains, what is the fitness function that this robot has to satisfy, or that any artificial intelligence has to satisfy. What makes it succeed? If it's going to succeed or fail, it's because of a certain fitness function. And the fitness function for this thing is economic. We hear about all the artificial intelligence that's happening in the universities, and it's very interesting stuff. I keep up with it too, I read the papers. But it's the commercial artificial intelligence that we really are interacting with. And that stuff has to serve a purpose, and it has to serve a profit. And as a guy who has retired hundreds of artificial intelligences in my career, especially in the online advertising world, I can tell you survival is not an easy thing. It's not a guaranteed thing, not even for something like Asimov that has the, uh, the power of Honda behind it. So his future is uncertain. He's not going to be walking around a hospital handing out prescriptions anytime soon because the intelligences that, have been, that we have generated in order to handle diagnosis and monitoring are being broken up into a bunch of different species who are own find, finding their own niches and trying to optimize against their own survival. In 1948, Norbert Wiener, one of my favorite authors, um, proved that two systems cannot communicate with each other if they don't coexist in the same dimension of time. Now, that sounds rather abstract, but it's very true. To communicate means to exchange information, and information is the resolution of uncertainty. That is its mathematical definition. You have an uncertainty before, and you have a resolution after. That's Claude Shannon's definition. You cannot have communication unless you have a dimension of time that establishes before and after. You can play around with that dimension of time, but you have to have a before and an after to establish communication between systems, like the systems Asimo is trying to invade. But just as important, there are a lot of potentially fatal communication blockages between us and an artificial intelligence. Imagine two people trying to communicate over a telephone wire via telephone who don't speak the same language. The only features they can exchange are words and they don't have words that they have in common. That's called the feature extraction phase of how an AI is learning from the world. <clears throat> so they would have a very difficult time communicating. AI has a very difficult time sucking data through this thin 
slice of the user experience so that it can create optimizations. Some of the things it will not be able to extract, not for a very long time, if ever, is the urge to care for somebody else. Or the ability to notice that a woman is struggling to read a form you just gave her, even though she has glasses on, because she may have ocular tumors. Your AI is not going to pick up that part of the communication system. Another thing it cannot comprehend in any way is taste. And in fact, as humans, we can't even communicate well about this right now. I can't talk to you about what is too spicy for you and then have a way to monitor that. It's hard to have a conversation about these sorts of intangibles. In the United States, Indian restaurants have come to moderate how much curry they will put into their food into what's called a normative response, right? The average response. I've had to go to the same restaurant, Indian restaurant, a multiple of times and say, I want it home style before they'll actually give it to me home style. And then the joke's on me. Um, <laughs> so what is a normative response? We do this all the time. Anytime we're about to cross cultures or we're about to create a new experience or bring new friends into new things, we provide a normative response. And we train our machines to do the same thing. We train our machines to say, if I had the time to read a billion rows of data and I, was, I didn't have time today because I had to pick up the kids, I would give this response too. So that's what a normative response is. And we're forcing these normative responses on, into our machines to come back with essentially averages and blasé predictions. Now this is perfectly scientific. You think about what a bunch of the medical profession is. I've been everywhere but this dot. <laughs> A bunch of the medical profession is saying, this worked for a patient that's kind of like you. And so I'm gonna give it to you now, and I'm hoping that this will work for you. It's perfectly scientific, but it limits your ability to deliver something extraordinary. So as the father of a daughter, this was an extraordinary moment for me. And I think it probably was for a lot of people. But the predictioneering that happened before this movie came out was pretty, pretty bland. It had a lot of positive indicators going for it. It's big special effects driven. It was branded content. Everybody knows who Wonder Woman is. Um, it had a great summer release, but it had some negative indicators coming out as well. It was emotional content. It was directed by a woman, and the character had appeared before in another movie, and that movie tanked. You probably you can't even name what that movie was. Anybody? So the machines and the humans came out with the exact same prediction. They said, how's this movie gonna do? And they all went, meh. Nobody really knew. Of course, post facto, there's a lot of belief that the presidential election impacted a female empowerment movement, and that drove box office for Wonder Woman, which is not something that's gonna make it into your neural net model. Female empowerment zeitgeist is not a variable in your logistic regression to predict box office success. And it's unlikely to be in the near future. So speaking of an extraordinary woman, here are two more. I am a proud dad, that's my daughter on the right. This is Sandra Park. Sandra Park uh, got 23andMe as a birthday present a couple years ago, and they send her all these follow-up questions all the time. Hey, can you fill out this questionnaire? We're interested in your health. And she got one one day, and she was going through and she's checking off like, has your handwriting become small? No. Has your voice become frail? No. And she's going down, she's going down. And at the end of this form, she realizes her husband has Parkinson's disease. She didn't know that. Her husband was being taken care of by a world-class medical institution. If I said the name, you'd know it and be like, hey, world-class medical institution. 23andMe is a massive data mining operation with thousands of servers who are doing great work every day. But the institution of marriage became the linking communication subsystem between this data mining operation with thousands of servers there and this healthcare system with thousands of doctors there. That informational subsystem is an important part of the entire ecosystem that the artificial intelligence is trying to invade. At this point, I probably sound like I'm trying to belittle artificial intelligence for not having a tongue. You, you suck, you don't have a tongue, which should causality be the other way around. Um, but I'm not, really. What these things do is pretty majestic. It's beautiful. Um, AI is going places we've never been, we can never go. It's exploring parts of the world that we've never seen from a data perspective. And I know I sound like a proud dad, but it is undeniable 
that when you have one of these things launch and they work and things start working out, and I'm working in cancer now, so my stuff sometimes helps people survive, it's an extremely satisfying feeling. But consider life as an artificial intelligence. You are relying on faint signals from a distant world. You're relying on people to remember to tell you things that are gonna be important to you, like female empowerment zeitgeist. You have only very low-powered signals you can send back. You can say things like, here's an average based on something that I think is kind of like something else that might be what you're looking for. And nobody gives you points for trying. <laughs> if you miss, nobody cares. Nobody's going to come by and say, oh, I'm sorry. And you don't even have the satisfaction of drowning your sorrows in a good curry and writing terrible poetry due to your hopelessness because there's no profit incentive for you to have those kind of motives. So you're completely at the whim of your makers. And I want to encourage you to think of these things as satellites. They're living out in a world, exploring parts of the world that we haven't had access to yet. But we're trying to get these signals back. And they're going to send us back basically the signals we tell them to. The more inventive we get, the better signals that will come back. But understanding that, how much we impact in our communication subsystems, impact how they respond to our world, is an important part in lowering the dialogue around artificial intelligence. The snakehead that I brought up in the first slide, it in fact has not taken over the Potomac River Basin. Um, the news reports are that it got introduced when a woman did what's uh, in Buddhism called an animal release ceremony. So this is a woman recovered from a very uh, terrible illness, and she drew upon the centuries-old tradition of finding an animal that was destined for the table, and instead releasing it into the wild. And this is a way to say thank you for my life, back to the universe, here's some life back to you. She, and in doing this, she's performing this incredibly human thing that is well beyond the experience of the artificial intelligence, and is well beyond the experience of that snakehead that got introduced. That snakehead has no idea what Buddhism is. But we all can respond to that. Everybody in, that room, in this room can respond to the beauty of that gesture. But the snakehead was not as optimized as we thought to handle these complex systems that it was suddenly dumped into. For one thing, I'm told, that thing tastes delicious. Thank you very much. <laughs>